I say bacteria, what's the first thing you think of? Well, after this video, I suspect the first thing you'll think is bacteria are so cool. My name's Valerie and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Future Energy Systems, or FEZ. FEZ is a research program at the University of Alberta focused on studying the energy transition. Now what in the world do bacteria have to do with the energy transition? Let me introduce you to the humble methanotroph. This bacteria eats methane, a greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change and has 25 times more global warming potential than carbon dioxide. In this series of clips, we'll meet two researchers studying these amazing methanotrophs. In this first part, we'll meet Mariah Hermery, a master's student who will explain the basics of these microbes and their usefulness, and then explore her work trying to better understand these methanotrophs. Hi everyone, my name is Mariah, and I am a graduate student at the University of Alberta, where I study in a microbiology lab. I would like to spend the next few minutes talking about one of my favorite topics in the world, microbes. Now I probably know what you're thinking. What's the big deal about microbes? Aren't they tiny living things that make us sick? Well, yes, there are many types of microbes, particularly some types of bacteria that can be harmful to us. Microbes or microorganisms simply are microscopic living things like bacteria, but can also include fungi, algae, and so much more. But out of all of the microbes on Earth, only a tiny percent, like less than 1%, can actually hurt us. Most microbes in reality are either our friendly neighbors or actively help us in many parts of our day-to-day -day lives. A great example of this is our health. A healthy individual needs to have microflora both on the outside and inside of their body. All over our skin and inside of our guts, we have healthy bacteria that protect us from the pathogenic bacteria that can make us sick. Also, the good bacteria in our guts can actually help us digest some of the food we eat so we can gain more nutrients. Speaking of nutrients, microbes are needed to make some of our favorite foods, from dairy products to bread products to fermented foods like miso and sauerkraut to super sour candies, and not to mention my favorite chocolate. I would argue that the best food is made with the help of microbes. Not only can microbes create fuel for our bodies, but they can also produce literal fuel. We know that microbes can create biofuels that can be used in our cars or in our jet planes instead of depending on traditional fossil fuels. My lab mates and I work with pretty neat microbes that can play a big solution in reducing greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change. These microbes are called methanotrophs, which basically mean methane-eating microbes. And not only do these microbes eat greenhouse gases like methane, but they can make interesting products along the way, such as biofuels and bioplastics. This is great since traditional fuel and plastic production uses fossil fuels, which is harmful to our environment. The specific methanotroph microbe I get to work with is called Methylomicrobium album BG8, or I simply just call it BG8. And BG8 has a unique trick on top of making biofuels for methane. We discovered that BG8 makes miniature versions of itself and releases it out into the environment. These tiny spheres are called outer membrane vesicles, which means that they have the same external or outside parts as the BG8 bacteria. But what about what's on the inside? Is BG8 throwing out garbage in these vesicles? Or is BG8 trying to send messages or perhaps even fight with other bacteria? My research project focuses on this question of trying to figure out what BG8 is moving inside of the vesicles. Why should we even care about these vesicles? Well, the more information we have about vesicles, the sooner we can use them to our advantage. Remember how BG8 can convert methane to biofuels? Well, if we understand why vesicles are being made, then we can tell BG8 to start putting the biofuels in the vesicles with genetic engineering. If you wanted to collect apples, it wouldn't make sense to cut down the tree to harvest apples when you can just grab the apples from the tree directly and keep the tree for the next harvest. We want to find more efficient ways to harvest biofuels. If the biofuels can be transported in the vesicles and then collected, then BGA can keep producing biofuel-filled vesicles many times over. 
That way, it's easier to generate more biofuels at a faster rate. Climate change is just one of the many areas where microbes are useful. In fact, microbes play a role in many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. When we are faced with a large problem in nature, it's easy to ignore these little microbes. But if we take a moment to appreciate all of the cool and important things that microbes do for us, we might find that they are essential pieces in the overall solution to our problematic puzzles. Thank you so much for listening. Now that we know how amazing these bacteria are, let's join Marina Lazic, who is using methanotrophs to produce biodegradable plastic. This has two benefits, because it reduces the non-environmentally friendly plastic and it reduces the methane in the air. Let's join Marina to learn about her research and then head to the lab where she'll show us how she prepares her bacteria for experiments. Hello everyone, my name is Marina Razic and I am coming from Faculty of Sciences. In the next few minutes, I will tell you the story about methane-based biodegradable plastic, the project that I am working on in my PhD thesis. I hope you all will enjoy. I am sure you also heard somewhere the term biodegradable plastic. But before I move forward, I would just like to emphasize that biodegradable plastic is environmentally friendly material and it could be used to produce all these plastic derived items that we are using on a daily basis. But in order to understand what bioplastic is, we first need to understand what traditional plastic actually is. So traditional plastic is composed of polymer called PET. The problem with PET is that it is highly toxic. Now, you all probably saw these blue beans all around the campus and all around the city, and I'm sure you all know that pet-based plastic should be discarded in this blue bin. But what happens if we make mistake and toxic pet plastic ends up in landfill container? So, as landfill is accumulating the waste, it is going to be piled up, and exposed to some environmental factors such as rain. So water from rain will be mixed with PET, which is toxic, and create something like a poison called leachate that will leak into the environment. And when leachate leaks into the environment, it threatens to harm wildlife, to contaminate water and ground. And we don't want this to happen. So, the solution that I am proposing is replacing a PET which is toxic with some other polymer that is not toxic. And that polymer is PHB. So, PHB is precursor for production of all these plastic items that we are using on a daily basis. And it's not toxic for the environment. If we succeed to replace PET with PHB, I'm sure we will have happy and healthy wildlife and happy and healthy planet. And that's what we actually want. The solution strategy for PHB production are bacteria that we call methanotrophs. These bacteria use greenhouse gas methane as a carbon source and they are able to transform methane into our environmentally friendly PHB. Bacteria that I am working on is called Methylocystis species strain rock well. And this is where I actually prepare media to grow my rock well cells. This is my lab bench and I am spending here a lot of time preparing my bacteria for experiments. So, in order to prepare this media, we are going to be focused first on the eye water. So, we are adding the eye water in specific volume, which is 90 milliliters in measuring lab dish. Hopefully, I won't spill it. Now, we are transferring the eye water into the bottle where we are going to grow our methanotropic bacteria. Okay. 
Next step is adding additional nutrients, which are nitrate mineral salts. These nutrients are required for bacteria to grow. We are adding 10 milliliters according to protocol. And we are labeling our media with specific tape which is in this case red, indicated that it belongs to me. Now, this bottle is ready to be sterilized in our plate. Okay. Now, we prepared our media to grow our mechanical bacteria. Next step is to make it sterile as safe environment for our bacterial growth because we want only the thermotropic bacteria, not other. In order to sterilize this media, we need this very special machine called Autotest. This machine operates with high temperature and high pressure. Now, in order to make sure that my media is sterile, I need to test this autoclave tape. Next step is to place autoclave tape on my bottle that I prepared like this and to lose gas a little bit just because this has a high pressure and we want to avoid explosion. Now, what this tape does is next. If my media is sterile enough or safe for metallotrophic growth, the tape will turn black. If not, then media is not sterile and we won't be able to grow our bacteria. In the next step, I will put my label frozen bottle into the outer plate and turn on high temperature pressure and wait somewhere around one hour when my media will be safe enough for metallotropic growth. After we finished with the autoclaving of our media, note a black tape which tells us that our media is sterile and ready for new inoculation. So this is what I'm going to do in the next few minutes. So before I start, sterilize the bottle slightly. Yes. And opening. I'm opening the bottle right here in this guy's safety cabinet, so this bottle cannot be opened out of my safety cabinet. Adding all components required for bacterial growth. We are tightening it. Now, I want to remove the air because that air will be replaced with the methane, and methane is good for this particular. Which I'm doing right now. 15 milliliters. And now we are adding a One year of old material culture into new media. And I'm getting rid of syringe. Now in next step I'm going to add matting, a carbon source for this one. Step, I'm going to add matting to bacterial growth media. So for that I need this gas tank that actually contains methane gas. As the first step, I'm going to release this vent here just to make sure that methane is free to come in to this syringe. I attach syringe this pipe and 
I'm slowly going to release the vent number two, and we can actually follow how methane enters the syringe. We are adding 15 mils, and after that's done, we make sure that this vent is tightly closed because we don't want methane to be released in the atmosphere. We are carefully deattaching the syringe, and we are keeping our finger to make sure that gas does not escape. And in final step, we are closing vent number one. And next step, I'm going to give my bacteria a carbon source, which is this methane. So notice that I am holding my finger to prevent methane leaking in the syringe. And in next step, I will actually use this filter and very press a test of the syringe. And we will this and now this goes in the field. So. After I finish adding a carbon source methane and bacteria. I'm measuring optical density, starting optical density, which I'm doing using this machine. Optical density is nothing else but measurement of growth. So I want to see how much bacterial biomass is at the beginning. Then I'm using this machine called gas chromatography or GC. And this machine is telling me how much methane I have at the beginning. It contains sterilized growth media with methane gas provided in a head space and with our methane eating bacteria. In the next step, we want to incubate this bacteria at optimal temperature, which is 30 degrees for these metabolites. This is our 30 degrees room where we keep our bacteria on shake. In the next step, I'm going to put this bottle on shaker and wait a few days until my bacteria grows. After this step, a few days after, I am again checking growth or optical density and I am checking how much methane remained. I want to make sure that my bacteria grow and I want to make sure that they are actually consuming methane which is helping them to grow. This is a space where I am actually extracting PHB. I want to see how much PHB my cell produced from methane. This is called fume hood and I am working here very carefully because to Extract PHB, you need some toxic chemicals such as chloroform, so you have to work in this safe environment. This is not sterile environment, but it is safe environment. It prevents contamination of the environment, of the nature. It prevents all toxic evaporation contaminate our environment. Final goal of all of these experiments is to make sustainable cycle. Here is how that looks. So you see one landfill waste digester, that's a plan. So in that landfill digester, you will have emitted methane. Then you would have something that is called bioreactor, which will contain our methanotrophs. So methanotrophs will perform metabolism and convert released methane into the PHB. PHB will be extracted and it will be sold as a material for production of biodegradable plastic and then that plastic will be returned into the digester so you have full circle sustainable process what do you think are you amazed by these methanotropes and all they can do thank you so much for joining us to learn about methanotropes today Make sure to subscribe to Future Energy Systems' YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our exciting content and check out the links below. There's so much to learn as we explore our energy future 